It's time for the Nappy Time Lectures with the Amateur Sommelier. So. Hello, everyone. The Amateur Sommelier back with another wine lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the impact of climate change on the wine industry. Because there are some things that need to be gone over in the area of climate change as well as what can be done to at least mitigate the effects of climate change in the wine industry. Objectives that we have for this presentation to discuss changes in grapes in relation to climate change, uh, name at least one region that will become a new source of wine production, uh, describe one strategy to help offset climate change, uh, both for grapes and for wineries. So, let's start with some major disclaimers. This is not a political channel. I think, for those who have been watching this channel for at least a good few months to a year plus, everyone knows that I'm not a fan of politics. Um... You don't need to go crazy in the comments about whether or not climate change exists, if it's not, you know, if it's just a cycle of how Earth heats and cools, and, you know, wherever you land on the spectrum with your opinion of climate change, we, I, I would like to not have to moderate the comment section on that. So that's the first thing. That being said... My background of science is not in geology, earth sciences, etc. So I think something is happening. There's evidence existing that climate change does exist. Whether or not it is climate change or, again, the natural heating and cooling of Earth's surface and core temperature and all that, I can't say for sure. Uh, these are also models, the sources I found, based on academia. So... No one is able to perfectly predict the future. I think that's quite certain. This presentation is more kind of a fun guesswork grounded in the basis of what we see in reality and science and what other people have been noticing and how they're addressing these issues. So, that being said, changes in grapes. Grapes are extremely sensitive to climate changes. As you get colder temperatures, the grapes don't ripen as well. There's lower sugar, there's higher acid, and, you know, someone suffering with acid reflux, I don't, I don't like higher acid. <laughs> I shouldn't be drinking wine technically, but that's a whole different story and phenomenon. Uh, going to the opposite end, the warmer, hotter temperatures. You're going to have lower acid, but you're also going to have higher sugar, and that translates to more alcohol, and the grapes will over-ripen. The models currently suggest that hotter temperatures are more serious. With the lower tans and acids, they're needed to be reinforced with tartaric acid. I believe it's how you pronounce that. Uh, for mouthfeel and stability. So when you have a full-bodied wine, you'll notice the acid and the tannin, one does not overpower the other. A true full-bodied wine has both of those in balance. So if you have lower tannins and acid, it's kind of a weaker wine. It's not full-bodied. It's semi-bodied. So that has to be reinforced um, as well a lower tannins obviously decrease the color of the red wines. It's kind of more Pinot Noir kind of color. I know some of those can be dark purple, but usually they're going to be more regular purple, kind of going to a deeper red, or even like a rosé um, red core for the color. So... Let's talk about changes in vineyards. There's two very serious issues with climate change that vineyards need to worry about. The w first one 
is the most obvious, being the rising sea level. If the sea level rises, obviously there's less land for vineyards. And the vineyards that are near kind of coastal areas near the ocean, those are going to be in danger of flooding. So we see this, you know, California is the big one we worry about. Bordeaux is the big one we worry about. Portugal is also what we worry about. Um, New Zealand, Australia, you know, we can literally keep going. Uh, the inland vineyards, so even if you're farther away from the coastal areas, as the sea levels rise, you have to contend with uh, Mauritian water, which is salt water, basically, which affects the vine growth. You know, if there's more salt, the vines don't grow as well. They need even more water. The salt just, you know, dehydrates them out. It puts pressure on the vines to be able to grow properly. Kind of like blood pressure with the um, heart pumping the blood. If there's more salt, it's harder to pump the blood. The other thing, uh, with rising sea levels, there's earthquakes being more possible. Obviously, California is not on here, but they're known for the San Andreas Fault. You know, in the same coastal area, though, Oregon, Washington, uh, British Columbia, go to South America, Chile, Argentina, and also New Zealand. They have, I forget what the fault line is around New Zealand, but there's definitely volcanic activity around there. I'm not sure where in the Pacific Rim because I think it's the Pacific Rim in that area but I don't know where that starts and ends. So changes in the wine region. So getting even bigger picture here uh, there will be regions with reduced viability. There will also interestingly be regions with increased viability. So as earthquakes, the rising sea levels as they keep occurring more frequently, we're going to see France is already having issues, especially in the Bordeaux region. There's issues in northern Italy, Australia, we've said, Spain, California. Lower altitude areas, areas close to oceanic coastlines, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to have to fight salt water, the flooding, a lot of other natural disasters. Very, very unfun time. Now, we did discuss on the previous slide, Oregon and Washington had risk for earthquakes. However, these areas also are at higher altitude areas, and they're also further north or south from the equator, closer to the poles. Which means that they technically get less sunlight, you know, all the time. So it's not going to be as hot. Granted, it's still going to get hot, but it's not going to be as hot. I found England to be the most interesting on this list, however. I really did, but apparently, from what I've researched, England's starting to get a really... Their wine industry is starting to become very robust. So I'll be very curious to try wines from England, actually made in England. I am. I will, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Because they're apparently starting to get on par with um, some French regions. I don't think they're on par with Bordeaux yet. But I think they're starting to get up there with Burgundy. Which is, that's, that's pretty big. The next thing we have to talk about. And ugh, if anyone knows me, I have a very irrational fear of bugs. Spiders. Etc. But the increasing temperatures most likely are going to increase the presence of insects and related diseases. And you can see them all there. I mean, mildew, it's, it's more like a fungus, but with increasing temperatures, there's going to be more fungus spores released into the wild. It's going to be an unfun time. I'm going to be very, actually, I don't want to know how curious it's going to be that when the glaciers release and all the frozen viruses and bacteria just decide to release and just cause calamity. It's, it's not going to be a fun time. I'll, I'll say that much. Changes in oak quality. Now, you would think with more CO2 in the atmosphere that the trees used to convert 
the CO2, help them grow, and put more oxygen in the atmosphere, that this wouldn't be a problem. And I actually found this interesting, too. Because, you know, obviously we use wood barrels for wine aging. I mean, also lots of other aging for beer and spirits and lots of other alcohols. But as there is more tree mass, it will make more barrels, but they're going to be, they're not going to have the best quality. So they're going to be weaker and break more easily. Which also leads to less tan in the barrel getting into the wines, which will lower the quality of the wines. Which for those of us who are not fans of the drier, heavy tan of wines will be like, yay! But for those of us like me, we're going to be quite, quite sad. And my theory on this... But yeah, we got bigger trees, but the quality of the barrels is going to be more terrible. I think it has something to do with carbon bonding and how the barrels are made specifically. And at least that's a theory. I don't fully know how wine barrels are made. But let me know in the comment section if you want to know. And you do a wine lecture presentation on how wine barrels are made. Wouldn't be the worst thing. So everyone asks, what can we do now? In the present to mitigate the future disasters that could be coming from my climate change. So we'll start with the grapes. The first thing you should do is shade the berries. You know the vampires. You know, they see the sun. They're like, I'm blind, the light. It burns. They pull the cape over themselves. They try to hide. Kind of the same concept. Not with, you know, the obviously vampire. Sort of. Thing. I really just lost my entire train of thought on there. I apologize. But basically, yes, you shade the berries. Uh, canopy usage. Uh, whether you want to use like a sheet or literally just blackout curtains. Equivalent. It will affect the grape color, sugar, and acid levels. Um, because obviously you're trying to block the amount of sunlight that goes in to help the berries grow. And it, um, yeah. So far it hasn't indicated it's the best method unfortunately. Because while you do shade the sun and try to make it cooler, the berries, the grapes, really do need the sunlight to, you know, grow because photosynthesis. It, it's kind of a thing. It is the Catch-22. You can also do nighttime harvesting. So when the sun's not out, it's cooler at night. Or it's supposed to be, unless you live in a place further down south, and you're just like, eh? and it's humid, it's awful. The nighttime harvesting, just get the grapes at night, as opposed to during the daytime, and quicker deliveries of the grapes to the winery, keep them cool. Okay, so you don't want the grapes, once they're picked, sitting out, because then that will affect the quality before they even get to the winery for fermentation. Now, something that I didn't know could be done, was planting winter cover crops. Which, unfortunately, when I read this, they didn't go into what those crops specifically are, but apparently what they're supposed to do are three things. They minimize the soil erosion and maximize the water and nutrient storage. How they do that wasn't really gone into either. But it's a very interesting topic, I guess. You're trying to plant different foods, crops, in order to not drain the soil just having one 
crop being planted. It's kind of like the cotton issue that happened in the South in the 19th century where you have all this cotton being planted and they just kept planting cotton, but they needed to reinforce the soil because it was just draining the soil of all the nutrients. They needed to plant different crops to kind of revitalize the soil to then grow more cotton. Back in those fields all over again. The next method is probably one that most people would agree should be done is water recycling. You know, there's drip irrigation, partial root drying, and sustained and regulated deficit irrigation. Basically, there's trying to capture the water that was you that wasn't used, excuse me, to help the grapes grow. Can we capture that water and then use it again? To keep the um, grapes properly hydrated with water at the same time as there's no runoff going into streams and lakes. We want to keep all that water for the grapes, essentially. Next point, um, it's a lot of words. It's an integrated pest management system. Basically, you want to minimize the amount of chemical grade pesticides want to use more natural pesticides because we don't want you know a bunch of chemicals being on these grapes to then have them fermented we we like the all natural so i think most people like all natural they're just like oh there's a bunch of weird crazy chemicals and possible carcinogens and ooh, it's nasty so that's the integrated pest management system one of the harder things that is suggested for a wine or a vineyard is to move to a higher altitude or latitude. And the very simple reason is it's a little hard to pick up a winery or a vineyard and just move to a higher altitude or latitude. The first and most obvious being the grapes and the vines and all the stuff that's already in the ground. It's a little hard to just literally pick up the entire ground where all the vines and roots are. It's like, I'm just going to exchange this whole area of grapes and roots and vines and just take out this plot of dirt and grass or whatever from this higher altitude area, and we're just going to exchange them. A little bit difficult. Would be really cool if we could do it. Very difficult. Almost near impossible. And then, of course, you have to do... I think there's zoning regulations and requirements for land building, landscaping. But lots of other things. It, it's a lot of... You have to get the government involved. And when the government gets involved, it, it just it's just not easy. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Government. Inefficient. What is the other last thing you do for grape varieties is grow different grapes that are more suited to the warmer climates. Um, you can see down there, most of these I believe are being done in northern Italy. I mean, obviously, Marcellan, Fiano, Vermentino, Nero de Avola, I believe, are very northern italy i think they're starting to get farther south near rome um but as far as i know this is more um a coalition of wineries and vineyards in northern italy trying this stuff out so lot we just did a lot about grapes so many about grapes what do we what do we do about the vineyards besides obviously attempting to move them and exchange plots of land, which is a little bit difficult. Cooling equipment to ensure completed fermentation processes. As someone who hasn't actually been behind the scenes at a vineyard or winery during fermentation processes, 
to see what equipment they actually use. I'm not sure how much energy is put into fermentation and how much is released. Being said, uh, cooling, if you get, you know, a batch of grapes and you're not doing nighttime harvesting and they're, you know, hot, warm, you know, cooling equipment to get them cooled down before we start fermentation is probably a good idea. Reinspecting hygiene practices and antimicrobial use, that goes back to pesticide management. We don't want a bunch of crazy chemicals and bleach flying around getting into the wines. Using more alcohol-tolerant yeast strains. This, I'm going to go more into in the next wine lecture. So I don't want to talk too much here, but there are actually hundreds of yeast strains that can be used to make wine. Now, how many of them can be used to make the wines we want, that decreases by hundreds. But, you know, you take any yeast, it's going to convert sugar into alcohol. That's just, that is the process of how fungi live, how they metabolize out, uh, excuse me, sugar, and they just happen to make alcohol. There's... It, it's a whole different lecture. We'll get there in the next one. Uh, controlling sugar levels in must using ultra filtration or reverse osmosis. This, again, relates to the alcohol-tolerant yeast strains. On the other hand, this is, hey, we don't want so much alcohol being made. Let's say the grapes are overripe. Let's not have all of this sugar be released from the must to make a lot of alcohol and make something that for a Cabernet Sauvignon would be like 15, 13 to 15%. And then since the grapes are overripe and they go somewhere between like 17 and maybe 20, which is close to a port. It's, we're trying to control the sugar levels there. Uh, next thing is consider acidification to prevent microbial growth and spoilage. This goes back to hygiene practices and microbial use. We're trying not to use all the crazy, possibly carcinogenic sort of chemicals um, to be antimicrobial, hygiene, etc. Again, what I kind of just talked about, harvesting grapes earlier for quickly ripening grapes. If they over-ripen, you know, you're going to have so much sugar that creates more alcohol. You have to acidify. And that's harvest grapes earlier. And last one, which I'm going to be honest, I don't know how this would actually work on a vineyard scale. Again, it's, it's frankly not my current area of expertise. To reduce fossil fuel usage using solar and other renewables. I don't, I, just, I don't work actually behind the scenes at a winery, unfortunately. To be able to expand upon that. So there's a small problem with all this. As there's always a small problem. We need more research. Again. These are model based projections. Nobody can actually. Predict the future. Anything can happen. So maybe with. The Paris Climate Accord. Everything gets better. And we don't have to worry about it. Although. With. Lots of other countries being involved in policies. It could also get worse. I'm not going to name any names. Although quite a few of these countries are in Asia. Cough, cough. Um, it, it, there's certainly a variation of, you know, we could be getting better with climate change. We could be getting worse. It's... All we know is that the temperatures are increasing. I mean, that's what the science says. It's going to take time to determine if any implementation based on the subclimate of where we're trying to grow the grapes, the location resources, is actually working. And unfortunately, it may not even not work at all, and then you need to adjust more, which takes more financial resources and 
other natural resources, and it just, eh. Oh, it's a mess. It, it, it very much so is a mess. Me personally, and I'm extremely biased, and you all know this, something should at least be done. Because I need my wine, gosh darn it. And, um, yeah. I like wine. Even though I shouldn't have it. But that being said, thank you guys so much for... Wow, that went a lot longer than I expected. Holy banana fart. Okay. I thought this was going to be really quick, and then it just didn't be quick at all. Wow. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised, though. So if you did enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. And I will catch you guys on the next wine lecture, which, geez, depending on how this went, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long one. Oof. All right. And last thing, of course. Sources provided by the links down below. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you all enjoyed. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.